So we've heard of uh, everything from Pfizer to Facebook. Um, from Bernard, thank you very much. And now we get to hear from our second speaker, who is um, Judy Trio San Juan, a long-term friend of the program and whom we're privileged to have with us today. Um, she received her JD and her Master's in International Studies in Spain and followed that with an LLM in Science Tech and Technology Law from Stanford University. Um, Judith has had a rich and multifaceted background uh, spanning the worlds of law, policy, technology, and health. Um, she's worked for a variety of organizations, including International Pharmaceuticals, IT Consulting, and Stanford's Center for Internet and Society. Um, in Washington, D.C., um, she worked for Knowledge Ecology International, where she provided technical assistance to developing countries on intellectual property law in negotiations at the World Health Organization and at the World Intellectual Property Organization, uh, while concurrently fulfilling her duties um, in the position of adjunct professor at Georgetown Law School, teaching a seminar course on access to essential medicine. Um, she's been the author of uh, numerous publications on intellectual property, R&D, treaties, access to medications, and has co-authored a curriculum for postgraduate uh, studies on legal implications of open source software at the Universidad Oberta de Catalonia. Um, she collaborates with different nonprofit organizations and has been a contributing editor for knowledge ecology studies and other publications. Um, in 2011, Judith moved to the New York office of Medicine Sans Frontiers as their U.S. manager for the Access Campaign. And in this capacity, she leads the team whose purpose it is to ensure greater access to and the development of life-saving and life-prolonging medicines, diagnostic tests, and vaccines for patients. Um, so with this, let us welcome uh, Judith. for this very kind introduction and thank you uh, Dr. So for inviting me. It's an honor as always. I always respond yes when you come <laughs> anytime, any day. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to bring a, a different perspective, a perspective of a humanitarian uh, medical organization looking at the issues of innovation and access, trying to put uh, the needs of patients first. Um, I'm very, very kind and I'm very happy to be here because we basically agree that there is a need for a think of the current innovation model and to look for a more open model that uh, responds to the needs that we have on innovation but also on access. So I'm going to say that yes, we need an open system, we need a different way of doing innovation, but we should never forget that access and affordability should be at the, at the center of our discussions. Uh, therefore, and patients and the recipients of these technologies and these new products should be uh, at the center of the design of any innovation model. So I'm going to talk to you specifically about something that's happening right now at the World Health Organization that's very exciting. Um, I was asked to talk about frameworks and, and policy space. And we think right now there is an opening, a legal, a political uh, a policy uh, opening at the World Health Organization. In the process that started maybe around 10 years ago, where basically the current innovation system started being uh, criticized and started being um, this defined as disrupted, as, as, as broken, uh, especially for the needs of developing countries. This process is still not concluded, but just yesterday, an expert working group at, um, at the World Health Organization uh, made public its report uh, on, on, an, on, 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 the, on the current innovation model and a proposal for a binding convention, for basically WHO member states to start negotiating a binding convention to research and development that I think could be useful in this conference because at the end it's really signed in, uh, and it's, it's a very long report, I'm not done reading it, it's 250 pages, but I will say it's mandatory reading for anybody at this conference. Uh, so I will say, uh, especially the students, <laughs> I will say it should be in all uh, the, the syllabus uh, for, for, the, for the classes. It's a, it's a very interesting report because it really puts together many of the issues that we are going to be seeing uh, in this conference. Um, so, like this. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's right. I'm not very technological, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Doctors Without Borders, um, you, you're all familiar, it's an international medical humanitarian organization. We founded around 40 years ago. We uh, work in around 70 countries. We provide consultation, general, 
around 8 million consultations a year. We work on a variety of diseases, from HIV AIDS to neglected diseases, to malaria, to vaccines, uh, to basic uh, healthcare. Um, um, within the MSF, uh, the section of MSF that I represent here is the Access Campaign. We were created in 1999, and we basically were a small, relatively small, in the size of the organization, <coughs> policy and advocacy team that deals with three basic mandates. We have three mandates that respond to the frustrations uh, of our medical uh, teams and our, our field teams uh, that ask us to solve or to look at three different frustrations. Why are medicines and medical technologies unaffordable? Why are they too expensive for MSA, but also for the partners with whom we work, the ministers of health and other NGOs? Uh, why are they unavailable, meaning they don't exist? That's uh, the postal chart for diaries and neglected diseases. And we have here with us Rachel Cohen for our, from our partner organization. I'm looking forward to hear your thoughts on all these issues from drugs for neglected diseases that speak just after me. Uh, why basically uh, drugs don't exist? Uh, uh, they are not available. Why the current innovation system has not delivered? the products that we need on, on a variety of diseases, like neglected diseases, or why are they unsuited? Why are they not adapted to uh, the resource poor settings where we work? They are not stabilized, uh, they are not adapted, the vaccines are not adapted to the delivery mechanisms that we need, or uh, there, for example, no HIV AIDS pediatrics because uh, there are no uh, children, nearly no children with HIV AIDS in the North. So why don't we don't have the technology that's adapted to, 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 and, and it's suited to the needs of patients living in developing countries. So after, let's get in 1995, so we've been working on these issues for a while, uh, and, and my colleagues, and, and basically we, we have concluded with many of the things that my predecessor said, that the system is broken, that the current system doesn't respond to the needs of developing countries, and therefore that we need a different system that responds to both innovation and access, that puts together innovation and access. We think the current system is make us believe that we have to choose, that we have to have innovation, uh, and we need innovation, and MSF needs innovation, and many other organizations need innovation, but at the expense of access, that we have to wait, that many patients have to die, and many patients have to wait before having access to these technologies uh, until monopolies finish, or until regulatory barriers are lifted, uh, and then we have to choose, and we don't think we have to choose. We think there is a system, there is a way of doing innovation that could put innovation and access together. Of course, the, uh, part of the open innovation discourse and the open innovation initiatives you're going to see in this conference is part of it, as I said, is, is about collaboration, it's about thinking innovation, but it's also about putting access at the front of the design of any innovation system. And that's what I think my organization is, is trying to push. So for us, and for many others right now, and, and that report that I mentioned, that it's mandatory reading, I think it makes a very strong case for this issue. For us, the key issue is that the current funding model, the current innovation model is broken, because it links, it, it, it basically makes this, this circle completely dependent, and that's the problem. It basically says that the only way you're gonna recover R&D costs, if, if medicines are expensive, who knows how much as it? I mean, the NDI is gonna show you, hopefully, data that shows that they are really doing R&D at a much lower cost than the pharmaceutical companies claims is possible. We need more transparency on R&D because nobody really knows, as, as my predecessor said, how much it costs. But whatever it costs, it's expensive. I mean, it is expensive to do research and development, and it's risky. Whatever it costs, it's linked absolutely linked to the price. Therefore, that makes that we have high prices in the field, meaning our patients don't get access, or they have to wait until generics enter the market, or we don't have research and development because they don't have the capacity to pay high prices. There's no incentive to do R&D on neglected diseases. So this link for us, this this circle is the is the is the is the cause nearly all the problems that we have right now with the innovation model. So what we're proposing and what this report that I mentioned makes a big case for us that we need to delink, we need to separate, we need to debroke this link. We need to look at ways of paying for R&D and incentive in R&D, but they don't depend on high prices. They don't make affordability and a negative externality of the current system. So we are looking at this, and this report, as I said, it's, it's looking at different mechanisms that could do this the link. Uh, so we basically advocating for uh, a different approach of financing R&D, separating the pain the way we pay for the cost of research and development from the price, this association of the link, that's, that's the key concept. That could judge should be basically the pathway, the judgment, the, the criteria that could judge any incentive mechanism that's been designed or that is being proposed. Um, we think that if incentives mechanisms are designed this way, that has a lot of positive externalities. It not only ensures access, because we don't depend on high prices, therefore we have better access, we have lower costs, we have more access to these products, but it also reshapes 
the way of setting development priorities are designed, and it, it, it's driven more by health needs and not so much by marketing opportunities or profit opportunities. The truly innovators can think more freely because they know they are in the cause of the truly innovation processes are going to be recovered. So they can think outside the box, they can collaborate, they can think about needs-driven R&D, not about profit-driven R&D. Uh, so the aim, again, is innovation and access, putting both objectives together. Um, and R&D needs both push and pull funding for the economies in the room. That means that it needs basically uh, to reward outcomes, but also to reward um, <coughs> efforts. And we think the linkage applies to both, could apply to both if uh, incentives for push and pull funding could, uh, could uh, be uh, well designed. So the process at WHO that we are very excited about and that I recommend you to, to become familiar if you're not, it started around 2003 uh, with a resolution at the World Health Assembly on intellectual property rights, innovation, and public health that basically was led mostly by Kenya and Brazil to, to um, very um, uh, highly uh, in influential developing countries in the whole process that basically called for the WHO to set up a special commission to look at the uh, inter relationships between intellectual property and innovation and intellectual property, uh, sorry, in innovation, intellectual property, and public health. We, we've been changing the order of these three uh, names uh, over the last 10 years, so I don't even know which order we define final one. So the first commission had that order, the second, the, the last report changed the order, but basically there's the three elements. And you have to understand that this is 2003. The TRIPS agreement, the global norm that regulates intellectual property, was approved in 1995. And it was basically just before 2005, where most of the developing world had to fully implement, mostly, mostly except the least developing countries, had to implement the TRIPS agreement for grandparents of pharmaceutical companies in 2005. So they were seeing basically the world thriving. They were seeing the high prices in 2003. They were saying, hey, in 2005, we will have to fully implement the TRIPS agreement. What's going to happen with innovation? What's going to happen with access? So at WHO, they start working up and seem slow. It's been 10 years, but we, we get in there. So there was this very important report, um, uh, an independent experts from all around the world. That, were, that uh, uh, It's an also very long, but also mandatory building, uh, that set up around 60, 70 recommendations. And it, it was already a, a very important report because it basically concluded that the current system has failed the developing countries, that there is no innovation driven by developing countries' interests, and there's a lot of access problems in both, in the three types of diseases, type one, type two, and type three basically mean <coughs> neglected diseases, the most neglected diseases, and neglected diseases like HIV, AIDS, and, 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 and TB, but also for type 1, meaning cancer, heart diseases, and type 1 innovation problems, of course, are the access problems, that these products are just not available. But there, there was a very interesting data also on the three varieties of diseases. The process evolved around the year. There's been a lot of resolutions and a lot of discussions, but I will highlight 2008, where the global strategy and the plan of action on public health, innovation, and intellectual property was approved. It's going to be a roadmap for all member states. That's outside the experts telling that member states what they have to do. This is a member states driven negotiation for three years. It was kind of, I was involved in that. It was like a treaty negotiation already. It was like a word by word negotiation on a roadmap on these issues. And it's a very important document, also mandatory reading for the students. Um, uh, and it's a very interesting document because it really highlights some of the ideas. It talks about the linkage, the need for me incentive mechanisms to separate the cost of R&D from the price of the product. And it talks about the R&D treating. It talks about the need of global norms. That this cannot be solved country by country, region by region. That there is a need of rethinking innovation as a global, as a global public good. Um, and um, in 2010, uh, another resolution came, and there was an expert working group uh, of independent experts and their personal capacity from all around the world that was created. Um, there were two, in fact, two expert working groups that were created. One in 2009, 2010. There was a failure in the sense that there were huge conflicts of interest. It was a mess, five minutes, thanks. Uh, and there was a second expert working group that took over that expert working group, and that's the what we call the real, the one, <laughs> the good working group that just concluded. And it's going to present its report at the next World Health Assembly this May. The report, as I said, was released uh, yesterday. This is the global strategy and plan of action, the main elements. And because I have five minutes, I'm going to focus on the expert working group, the, the, the one that just released its report. Uh, the mandate of this expert working group was to examine current financing or coordination of research and development, as well as proposals for new and innovative sources of financing to stimulate research and development related to type 2, type 3, diseases for the specific research and development needs of developing countries, and in relation to type 1 diseases also, as it relates to developing countries' needs. Basically, what the report says, what the main recommendation to the report is that we need the support and open knowledge innovation approach to science, 
uh, including use of a credible license, parent pools, pre competitive RD platforms, open source and, uh, and access mechanisms, including prices, innovation inducement prices. Uh, it, it, there is a lot of good ideas in this report. It talks about the need to incentivate uh, and to help developing countries develop their R&D capacity and the manufacturing capacity. Uh, it talks about the need for pooling funding. So it talks about the need of a sustainable source of financing for these issues. Um, and, and, and also the need for better coordination mechanisms on R&D priorities. But for us, uh, quite aggressively and quite uh, controversial, maybe two years ago, maybe a year ago, but I hope not controversial anymore, it talks about the need of a binding global R&D framework on, uh, on global health. And it even says uh, what are the possible elements of such a global framework. It talks about basically, I will, I will summarize, it's a 250 page report and I'm not done, but it basically <laughs> talks about three main issues. The need for sustainable funding, meaning that we need to, re to create a structures that really create a stable source of funding for research and development. In such talking, it even gives some numbers about that all WHO member states should start contributing to, the, to research and development, and it given, uh, gives some numbers of how much they should be contributing based on, on the GDP. So if you're richer, you should contribute more, but if you're a middle-income economy, you should also contribute. And if you're poor, if you're like a, a very, very, very least developed country, the numbers are minimum, really nothing. But if you are an economy that's growing, you should start thinking about investing on research and development. And it, it's a very interesting, uh, and it's a binding convention. The proposal is that these are going to be binding obligations. It talks about the need to better coordinate the way research and development is done globally, to talk about the needs to deliver research and development, and more uh, driven on, on the needs of patients, on the needs of, 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 the, of, the, of the final, of the final, uh, of the signatories of these technologies. It talks again about offer knowledge innovation, incentives that believe that separate the cost of innovation from the price of the products, about collaboration, about making the whole research and development process more um, transparent and more effective. Um, and it talks about strengthening capacity in developing countries because we know R&D can be done better and can be done more efficiently, but we know also that we can not only rely on structures based in developed countries, we need to start uh, Bring, building technology capacity uh, both for innovation and also for manufacturing uh, in developing countries. The HIV AIDS example for MSF is, is of course our poster child. I mean, we are right now uh, living a revolution on HIV AIDS. It's still in danger, but we have reduced the cost. MSF and the world has reduced the cost of HIV AIDS treatment over the last 10 years by 99% because um, we, uh, there are right now more than 6.6 .6 million people on treatment because we have learned how to do um, how, to, how to manufacture products of high quality uh, much cheaper. And that's basically being by manufacturing most of them in India, more than 80, 80%, 90% of the products we use in developing countries come from India. And so there, there are a lot of lessons to be learned from Antibia. So this is, this is basically the content of the convention. I had a speech about how the US government should do better, but I, uh, my time is running out. But basically my point is that we live in a times of tremendous opportunities. I think it's fantastic that this conference is happening, the timing is perfect, because we need to have a rethink on open innovation. And we, we need to really be pushing for new, new models for innovation. But I would say that from my MSF perspective, we should always put access at the front of any design of any incentive mechanisms and affordability and needs to driven research and development. So openness is good, collaboration is good, it's going to make research and development more affordable and it's going to make it for the innovators. But we also want it to make more affordable for the end patients. Uh, and, and accelerate access to these technologies. So the timing is the next me, uh, the US government, because I'm in the US, I'm gonna do a US speech, should support this convention. Uh, US government has traditionally not been very good at this, at this discussion with the World Health Organization. They've been quite defensive of the traditional mm, business models of pharmaceutical industry. So we hope and we, we, are, we ask you to, to, to support us in, in that call that the US government will play a much more constructive role in this next World Health Assembly and will allow for these negotiations to continue and for the convention negotiations specifically to start. Thank you so much.